Catherine Mary Knight, born 24th of October 1955, was convicted for the savage murder of her partner and de facto husband, John Charles Thomas Price, born 6th of January 1955. The murder took place in February 2000 and Knight was sentenced on November 9th, 2001. Knight is currently imprisoned at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre in New South Wales. She was the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, the harshest possible sentence in Australian law. Her prison file is marked never to be released. This is the story of Catherine, the Black Knight of Aberdeen. Unfortunately, another case of victim turned perpetrator, if her testimony is to be believed. One of the reasons I started researching crime and mainly serial killers was my insatiable curiosity to find out why these people cross that line. What makes serial killers different from the rest of the world? Is it nature? Or nurture. Since I started looking into these cases when I was a teenager, things have moved along since then. We now know more about psychopathic killers, although it still remains pretty much a mystery. My first thoughts on Catherine Knight before I really looked into her case was to wonder if by being an abattoir worker, was she somewhat desensitized to cutting up flesh? Through my research on serial killers, the one thing that was quite common with many serial killers who dismember was their distaste for doing it the first time. Not all of them got pure pleasure out of dismembering their victims. Sometimes the reason for doing this was purely for disposal purposes, not for fun or even consumption, no matter what we want to believe. If you watched my intro video for this channel, you will see that I referred to the Kelleher typology that lists the different categories of killers. I would say, without knowing much about Catherine Knight at this point, that she falls into the revenge killer category. Let's see if I'm right. It is estimated that one in every 100 people is a full-blown psychopath. Many more are borderline, often in the workplace, thriving at somebody else's expense. 
They will rule through fear and intimidation, two classic traits of the psychopath. And you can't cure psychopaths. We know that the brain is hardwired differently with psychopaths. The frontal lobe, which controls our emotions, is switched off. The extreme profile of criminals with psychopathy has long intrigued and captured the attention of both laymen and academics. In the past two decades, with the development of neuroimaging techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, research has vastly grown. We now know more. In fact, neuroscientists from Nanyang Technological University at Singapore, the University of Pennsylvania and California State University have recently discovered a biological distinction between psychopaths and non-psychopaths. Using magnetic resonance imaging scans, scientists discovered that the striatum, an area of the forebrain, was 10% bigger in psychopathic people compared to a control group of individuals with low or no psychopathic traits. So, is Catherine Knight a psychopath? Is she a narcissist? While I don't have the credentials to diagnose psychopathy or narcissistic personality disorder, I can certainly inject my opinion based on experience and research on narcissism and tell you that I believe she most certainly is a narcissist. Other professionals have said the same thing. And recognizing a narcissist is not diagnosing, by the way. Many people confuse the two terms, narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. The disorder is a recognized and registered diagnosis which can only be made by a mental health professional and requires some time to be spent with the patient. Calling someone a narcissist, however, is a bit like calling someone kind or nasty. It is an adjective that describes traits of a personality. A hallmark of psychopathy is having no conscience or empathy. They can also be grandiose, manipulative and arrogant. But these are also traits of a narcissist. And here we come to the crux of the matter. All psychopaths are narcissistic, but not all narcissists are psychopaths. Perhaps sometime in the future, I'll give narcissism and or psychopathy its own video. FBI criminal profiler Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole and clinical psychologist Dr. Lee Giarratano both agree that Catherine Knight is indeed a psychopath. They also agree that nature and nurture both play a part in Knight's behavior. Experts agree that a combination of childhood abuse and genes can create a monster like Catherine Knight. Her crime was so abhorrent that people could not believe it. Her homicidal outbursts started at a very early age so even though her childhood was dark and violent, the lines of abused to abuser seemed to mesh with her very early on. To understand a little more about the background of this, we need to go back in time to a place called the Upper Hunter Valley a small mining and farming town near Aberdeen in New South Wales, Australia. Until March the 1st, 2000, this sleepy part of Australia, situated on the New England Highway, 
266 kilometers north northwest of Sydney, population 1750, was best known as the birthplace of the blue healer cattle dog, the canine icon that is as much a part of Australian folklore as the emu, koala and kangaroo. But not anymore. These days, Aberdeen is known as the home of Catherine Knight, arguably the most depraved monster in Australia's grisly homicidal history. Visitors to Aberdeen are now far more interested in ogling the single-story three-bedroom bungalow at number 84 Andrew Street, where a murder and other unspeakable acts took place, and pondering what would cause the middle-aged housewife, mother and grandmother to perpetrate such evil. She was born and raised in an unconventional and dysfunctional family environment. Her mother, Barbara Rowan or Ruffin, I'm going to go with Rowan as I like that better. So her mother, Barbara Rowan, had been married to Jack Rowan and lived with him in the small town of Aberdeen in New South Wales, Hunter Valley. They had four sons, Patrick, Martin, Neville and Barry, before Barbara began an adulterous relationship with Ken Knight, a friend and co-worker of her then husband. Local backlash forced Barbara and Ken to move to Maury. None of her sons went with her. The two eldest boys, Patrick and Martin, continued to reside with their father and the two younger boys, Neville and Barry, were sent to be raised by an aunt in Sydney. Barbara had four additional children with Ken, including two boys, Charlie and Shane, and twin girls born on 24th of October, 1955, in Tenworth Hospital, Tenterfield. Catherine Knight was one of these twin daughters, half an hour younger than her twin sister, Joy. In 1959, when Knight was four, Jack Rowan died and his two older boys, who had been living with him, moved in with Barbara and Ken. Ken Knight was an abattoir slaughterman who travelled with his family throughout Queensland and New South Wales, applying his back-breaking trade in 12-hour shifts at Walangara, Gunedar, Tenterfield and Moree, and wherever the work was to be found. Ken and Barbara and their six children eventually settled in Aberdeen in 1969, where there was steady work at the local abattoir. From all accounts, young Catherine was a loving little girl who was kind to animals, and her only brush with retribution was as a 13-year-old when she appeared before the children's court on a minor charge and received a good behaviour bond. Ken Knight was also a violent alcoholic who would rape Barbara several times a day. Barbara, in turn, often told her daughters intimate details of her sex life and how much she hated sex and men. Later, when Catherine complained to her mother that one of her partners wanted her to take part in a sex act she didn't want to perform, Barbara told her to put up with it and stop complaining. Catherine claims she was frequently sexually assaulted by several members of her family, though not by her father, which continued until she was 11. Although there were doubts about the details, psychiatrists accept her claims and the events have been largely confirmed by other members of the family. Catherine was by all accounts a pleasant girl who experienced uncontrollably murderous rages in response to minor upsets. 
According to clinical psychologist Dr. Lee Giaratano, Knight had already dissociated at the age of three due to the violence around her. She learned to defend herself in a way that cut off emotions and the growing, thus maturing, of emotions. At school, she was well known for her violent temper. Barbara's great-grandmother was an indigenous Australian from the Maori area who had married an Irishman. Barbara was proud of this fact and identified as Aboriginal. This was kept a family secret, as there was considerable racism in the area at the time, and Barbara's descent was a source of tension for the children. Apart from her twin sister, the only person whom Catherine was close to was her uncle, Oscar Knight, a champion horseman. She was devastated when he committed suicide in 1969 and continues to maintain that his ghost visits her. The family moved back to Aberdeen the same year. When she attended Muswellbrook High School, Catherine became a loner and is remembered by classmates as a bully who stood over smaller children. She assaulted at least one boy at school with a weapon and was once injured by a teacher who was subsequently found to have acted in self-defense. By contrast, when not in a rage, Knight was a model student and often earned awards for her good behavior. Upon leaving school at 15, without having learnt to read or write, she gained employment as a cutter in a clothing factory. Twelve months later, she left to start what she referred to as her dream job. She joined her father, twin sister Joy, and brother Charlie, boning out carcasses and decapitating pigs at the local abattoir the Aberdeen Abattoir Makeworks. Given her lifelong environment, it's hardly surprising that all Catherine Knight wanted to do when she grew up was to work in the abattoirs. In every town she had ever lived, there was a meatworks. Catherine took great interest in her job and would often wander over to the start of the production line and watch the pigs actually having their throats cut. Other employees found her macabre interest a little strange, but just assumed she was just looking at other areas of the job. Others noted that Knight had an unusual approach to her job, reveling in certain aspects of it. She would nick arteries of the animals just to watch the blood come out. She took a malevolent pleasure in death. It is believed that her bloodlust for people was most probably satisfied by this job. The abattoir was her killing field. This raises an interesting question for me. If Knight had not had this job, would she have committed the crime in the way that she had done? She was quickly promoted to boning and was given her own set of butcher's knives and so began her lifelong fascination with knives. In the predominantly male domain, Catherine became as tough as the best of them and gave as much as she got in the boning floor jargon that would make a wharfy blush. She was renowned for not taking a backward step and with her knife in hand, she would challenge anyone who offended her to armed combat to abruptly sort the matter out. No one ever took her on. Catherine's proudest possession was her set of razor-sharp boning knives, which she kept in pride of place above her bed, so that, as Knight said, they would always be handy if I needed them. A habit she continued until her incarceration. 
everywhere she lived. Given her future violence, it would be fair to say that it was this period in her life that played a major role in the molding of the monster that Catherine Knight would become. Catherine first met hard-drinking co-worker David Stanford Kellett in 1973 and completely dominated him. Kellett engaged in heavy drinking, which stemmed from two traumatic incidents from his previous railway job in Coffs Harbour. First, when his best friend was killed in front of him in a shunting accident, and later when he rescued injured occupants of a school bus in Kempsey, which had been struck by a train, killing six children. He eventually lost the job due to deteriorating behavior and performance, but he soon got work at the nearby Aberdeen Abattoir and became close friends with Knight's brother. Often, if Kellett got into a fight, Knight would step in and back him up with her fists. In Aberdeen, she was well known for physically threatening anyone who upset her. Knight married Kellett in 1974 at her request. With the couple arriving at the surface on her motorcycle with a very intoxicated Kellett on the pillion. As soon as they arrived, Knight's mother, Barbara, gave Kellett some advice. The old girl said to me to watch out, quote, you better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got a screw loose somewhere. On their wedding night, Knight and Kellett consummated their marriage three times, but he made the mistake of falling asleep and not fulfilling what Knight believed was the norm on a wedding night. Knight was told that her parents had sex five times on their wedding night. Kellett was abruptly woken up with Knight's hands around his throat attempting to strangle him. He managed to fight her off, but this was just the beginning. Even though she attempted to kill him only one day into the marriage, the union lasted for 10 more years. The marriage was, however, far from perfect. Kellett was often unfaithful and once even left his wife and their two daughters in the middle of the night. Their daughter, Melissa, was born on the 11th of May, 1976. By this time, David was seeing other women, and six weeks after the birth of their daughter, Knight tried to stab David with a broken beer bottle. Tired of her violent outbursts, Kellett left for Queensland with his new girlfriend after two years of marriage. The next day, Knight was seen furiously striding down the main street, ranting and raving, pushing her new baby in a pram, violently swinging the pram from side to side. And at one point, she seemed to almost push the pram onto the road into oncoming traffic. Police were called and she was admitted to St. Elmo's Hospital in Tamworth, where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression treated with antidepressants and spent several weeks recovering. After being released, Knight's fury didn't seem to have subsided and her husband was still nowhere to be seen. Still raging with anger, Knight then went to the railway tracks and left her baby daughter, Melissa, on the tracks and walked away with the next train due any minute. The owner of a nearby shop 
saw this, but it took another hero to save the child. A man known in the district as Old Ted, who was foraging near the railway line, found and rescued Melissa, by all accounts only minutes before the train passed. But Knight's violent outburst was by no means over. She stole an axe from someone's backyard, went into town, waving the axe around her head like a madwoman, threatening to kill several people randomly. Knight was arrested and again taken to St. Elmo's Psychiatric Hospital, but signed herself out the following day. Some articles are reporting slightly different timelines. You'd be amazed at how many different versions of each violent episode is out there. This is one of the things I despise about reporting, the sensationalism, how people twist the stories. You'd think they wouldn't need to do that here. This story is bad enough on its own. It doesn't need to be embellished. It's fine as it is. It stands up in its own horror, okay? Anyway, Knight signed herself out the following day. I think by this time she had also been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and the medical professionals had said they couldn't do anything else for her, so they just let her go. Personally, I think she should have been committed at this point. Days later, she loses it again. How this woman has managed to get to this point in her life without actually killing anybody thus far is a bloody mystery to me. A few days later, Knight continued her rage against her husband's absence. Leaving her baby daughter in the house, she knocked on a neighbor's door, telling them her baby was ill and they needed to drive her to hospital. Knight went home and the neighbor with her children in the car drove to Knight's home to pick up baby Melissa. One of the neighbor's daughters went into the house with Knight to get Melissa out of the cot. But Knight suddenly produced a knife and began to chase the girl out of the house. She even managed to slash her face. She then took the family hostage and ordered them to take her to David's mother's house. On the way, Knight's neighbor, who was bleeding profusely, had somehow convinced her that they needed to stop at a service station and let one of the boys out because he was asthmatic. The boy then alerted the police. When police responded to the frantic call from the petrol station owner, they arrived to find Catherine holding a little boy by the front of his shirt and waving a knife in the air. The officers managed to drag the terrified child away by attacking Catherine with a couple of brooms that were handy and grabbed her when she dropped the knife and let the lad go. Knight was not charged, but instead shipped off, again, to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. She was detained under supervision while her baby daughter was placed in the care of her grandparents, Barbara and Ken Knight. Knight told the nurses she had intended to kill the mechanic at the service station because he had repaired Kellett's car, which had allowed him to leave, and then kill both her husband and his mother when she arrived in Queensland. Police notified David Kellett who was by then working as a truck driver in Queensland, that his wife was locked in a psychiatric ward under heavy sedation in the most notorious mental institution in New South Wales. With his mother, Kellett drove the hundreds of kilometers to be with his troubled wife, who sparked up the minute she saw him. On August the 9th, 1976, Catherine was released into the care of her mother-in-law on the condition that Jean see to it that she takes her medication. Good luck with that. David drove Knight and his mother to Aberdeen to collect their daughter, Melissa. As they arrived, Knight's mother, Barbara, came out of the house and proceeded to choke David through the car window. 
Knight saw this and knocked her mother down, saving David's life. Well, those two are certainly two peas in a pod. Within a couple of weeks, Knight and Kellett relocated to Woodridge near Ipswich, just west of Brisbane, Queensland, where they moved into a rented bungalow to make a fresh start. Kellett drove trucks and Knight took a job boning at the Dinmore Meatworks in Ipswich. But this was only to be the beginning of a life of attacking people who got in her way. What I also find very disturbing is that other family members witnessed abuse and they never said anything. David Kellett's sister, Sandy, lived with them for a while and actually got to know Catherine. And according to Sandy, although she was prone to flying off the handle for no apparent reason, she was lovely and charming. But Sandy wants court night, trying to put a daughter's hand under scorching hot running water in the bathroom. She then told David what she saw and he made her promise not to say anything tonight on that evening because she will kill both of us in our sleep. In 1979, David found Catherine in bed with another man and begging for one more chance, she and David moved to Landsborough where Catherine convinced David of having another baby. Oh yes, have another baby, that will solve all the problems. When Catherine was pregnant with their second child, David came home late from the pub after celebrating a win at a darts competition and Catherine was waiting for him. She hit him on the head with a skillet, fracturing his skull. He staggered to a neighbor's house before collapsing. He spent the next week in hospital. In the meantime, Catherine was burning all of his belongings in the bathtub. The police wanted him to press charges, but Catherine had managed to persuade him not to, for the sake of the children. At this point, Knight was becoming more and more violent and David was getting more and more scared of staying with her. Catherine regularly flew into violent rages over nothing in particular, assaulting her husband with her fists, kitchen appliances and anything else she could lay her hands on. Yet astonishingly, on March the 2nd, 1980, they had another daughter, Natasha Marie. David Kellett recalls at a murder trial that she was unpredictably violent, a phrase that would come up again and again when people described her. One time, her victim was a police officer who was stabbed by Knight. Yet Knight was let off any charges because people knew that was how she was. David Kellett remembers another scene, one that came horrifyingly true for another man. One morning, he woke to find Catherine sitting astride his chest, a knife in her hand, grazing David's throat. Catherine just laughed at him, saying how easy it could have been for her to kill him. Another case of her unprovoked violence is the attack on then 16-year-old Margaret Macbeth. Margaret became embroiled in an argument with Catherine and was cut severely across her face. Margaret required hospitalization and stitches. Finally, Knight was interviewed by police following the attack and sent again to the psychiatric hospital for assessment. She told tales of woe to anyone who would listen. Nothing was her fault. One night in 1984, after several violent outbursts from Catherine, David came home from work and found the house completely empty. Night had just gone. Everything was gone, except for one worn out sofa. Knight had moved back to Aberdeen. 
She first stayed with her parents and then rented a house in McQueen Street, nearby Muswell Brook. Although she returned to work at her beloved abattoir, she injured her back the following year and went on a disability pension. Since she no longer needed to rent accommodation close to her work, the government gave her a housing commission residence in Aberdeen. Knight, now using her maiden name, met 38-year-old miner and former speedway driver David Saunders in 1986. A few months later, he moved in with her and her daughters, although he kept his old apartment in Scone. Saunders said that the honeymoon period only lasted a couple of months. According to his ex-wife and others, David Saunders was a nice and polite man, a man who was not prone to violence, although he liked to drink. Knight soon became jealous regarding what he did when she was not around and would often throw him out. He would move back to his apartment where she would invariably follow and beg him to return. In May 1987, she cut the throat of his two-month-old dingo pup in front of him for no more reason than as an example of what would happen if he ever had an affair. According to Knight, she did this in retaliation for being punched in the stomach during one of their fights. Knight was supposedly pregnant at the time. Now, I'm not sure if this is something that Knight has said or if the various articles have inserted this info, but according to my timeline of events, it is not possible that Knight was pregnant at this point. If the dates are correct, and I believe they are, because most articles state the same dates, May 1987 was when she killed his dog, and June 1988 was when their daughter was born. I am shite at maths, but even I can figure that one out. Also, some sources say that Knight went on to knock Saunders unconscious with a frying pan after killing his dog. Again, I'm not sure if that has been inserted or even confused. In June 1988, she gave birth to a third daughter, Sarah, which prompted Saunders to put a deposit on an old weatherboard cottage in Aberdeen, which Knight paid off in full when her workers' compensation came through in 1989. Considering that, outside of her children, the tiny two-bedroom weatherboard house on McQueen Street was the first real possession that the feral Catherine Knight had ever owned in her life, it's hardly surprising that she decorated it the way she had always dreamed of, with her passion of dead animals. The walls were covered in cow hides, water buffalo and steer horns, old-fashioned fur wraps, cow and sheep skulls and deer's antlers. Prominently displayed was a stuffed peacock and baby deer. Among the other bric-a-brac adorning the walls and hanging from the rafters were a huge wooden fork and spoon, machetes, rusted animal traps, leather coats, motorcycle jackets, a rusted rake and pitchfork, a riding boot and crop and a saddle. Every available space was filled with old newspapers, clothes and books. The extensive video collection dealt predominantly with horror and death. It was a museum of Catherine Knight's fantasies. No space, including the ceilings, was left uncovered. There's no place like home. One night, Saunders came home only to be greeted in the face with a hot iron. The reason? He was late home. Knight then stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. Then she went to her sister's house with a shotgun, saying that she had killed Saunders. 
Clinical psychologist Dr. Lee Giarratano believes she did this as a way of rehearsing the actual killing and to see how people would react without actually going through with it. Saunders moved back to Scone, but when he later returned, he found she had cut up all his clothes to shreds and taken them to the rubbish tip. Saunders had tried on numerous occasions to leave Knight, but each time she lashed out violently. Allegedly, not long before the end of their relationship, Knight vandalized David's car and then took an overdose of sleeping pills. She was then admitted again to a psychiatric hospital for observations. One day, Saunders decided he had had enough. So he took long service leave from the mine and told Knight he was going to visit a mate in another town. He moved to Newcastle and went into hiding and disappeared from Knight's life. Knight tried to find him, but no one admitted to knowing his whereabouts. Knight was so furious that she told their two-year-old daughter that he was dead. Several months later, Saunders returned to see his daughter and found that Knight, in his absence, had gone to the police and unjustly told them she was afraid of him. They issued her a restraining order against him, which meant he couldn't legally see his daughter. It didn't take Catherine Knight long to find another lover. And a few months into the relationship, she was already pregnant. The father was a local recovering alcoholic, John Chillingworth, 43, who worked at the Aberdeen Meatworks. And the baby, a boy named Eric, was born in 1991. There is not much documented on Knight's relationship with Chillingworth other than one violent episode where Chillingworth admits to hitting Knight once after she had pushed him too far, smacking his glasses off his face and breaking his false teeth in his mouth. Their relationship lasted three years and ended after Chillingworth learned that Knight was having an affair with John Charles Thomas Price. From what I can gather, it was Knight who left Chillingworth for Price. This was without a doubt Chillingworth's luckiest day. As for John Price, he signed his own death warrant when he walked into Catherine Knight's sordid life. John Charles Thomas Price, 4th of April 1955 to the 1st of March 2000, or Pricey to those who knew him, was the father of three children when Knight began an affair with him. Reputedly a terrific bloke, liked by everyone who knew him, his own marriage had ended in 1988. While his two-year-old daughter had remained with his former wife, the two older children, a teenage boy and girl, lived with him. Price was well aware of Knight's violent reputation as she moved into his house in 1995. He owned a three-bedroom brick bungalow on St Andrew Street in Aberdeen and brought home a good salary from working in the local mines. He went into the relationship with his eyes wide open, and his children liked her. He had heard all the rumors about the way she treated her men, but chose to ignore them. Price's nickname for Catherine was the Speckled Hen. As with all of her previous partners, Catherine's relationship with Price soon turned violent. Knight even tried to force Price into marrying her by stealing his money and buying her own engagement ring. In 1998, 
When Price further refused to marry her, she retaliated. She videotaped items he had allegedly stolen from work and sent the tape to his boss. Although the items were out-of-date medical kits that he had scavenged from the company rubbish tip, Price was fired from the job he had held for 17 years. That same day, he kicked her out and she returned to her own home while news of what she had done spread throughout the town. A few months later, Price restarted the relationship, although he now refused to allow her to move in with him. The fighting became even more frequent and most of his friends would no longer have anything to do with him while they remained together. Price's daughter, Rosie, warned her father of night and often begged him to get rid of her. Catherine was trying to wrestle control of the house which Price owned and got into conflict with Price's kids, accusing them of molesting her own children. Knight had even told friends and co-workers that she wanted to kill Price. Eventually, an argument got out of hand and Catherine stabbed John. According to one source, Knight had discovered Price's will stating that he had left everything to his ex-wife and children. This only enraged her and she demanded $10,000 to leave. At some point throughout all of this, Knight had even told one of Price's daughters that Price was not her real father. Price's children also remembered times when Catherine was driving down the road and instead of swerving to avoid a dog that ran across the road, she would actually swerve into the direction of the dog. She once asked her nephew to steal John's car, burn it, and then throw battery acid at John's face. Of course, her nephew was like, no fucking way. Okay, brace yourselves here because this is where it starts to get really gruesome. Days before Knight killed Price, on the 27th of February, they had a huge fight that resulted in the police being called. Price wanted the police to remove Knight from his home. The police, however, informed Price that they couldn't do anything without a court order. This poor man must have been going out of his mind. He needed a court order to remove the woman who eventually kills him within days from his own house. It is believed that this action was what spurred Knight into planning his murder for real. Again, the details leading up to Price's murder vary slightly depending on which article or documentary you watch. So I've minimized the fine details and tried to piece together what fits into the timeline. On Tuesday, the 29th of February, John Price stopped at the Scone Magistrates Court in an attempt to take out an apprehended domestic violence order, ADVO, which is basically a restraining order. It does pretty much the same thing. In Australia, depending on the state, these can have different names, but they're fundamentally the same. I don't know if he actually succeeded because some sources say that he was told it would take weeks. So I'm assuming he applied and walked out of the court with nothing physical in his hand, but knowing that the lengthy process had been put into action. That afternoon, Price told his co-workers that if he did not come to work the next day, it would be because Knight had murdered him. He had even shown them previous stab wounds that Knight had incurred. Despite their pleas that Price should not return home, he stated that he was afraid Knight would kill his children if he didn't. At this point, it seems that Price knew what was coming and he was very afraid, but he was more afraid for his children. He had every reason to be afraid. Price arrived home 
to find that Knight, although not there herself, had sent the children away for a sleepover at a friend's house. He then spent the evening with his neighbours before returning home and going to bed around 11pm. Earlier that day, Knight had videotaped all her children while making comments which have since been interpreted as a crude will. She later arrived at Price's house while he was sleeping and sat watching television for a while before taking a shower. She then changed into new black lingerie which she had bought earlier that day. She then woke Price and they had sex, after which he fell asleep. And that's when she struck. Taking the butcher's knife that she had next to the bed and stabbed him while he was sleeping. According to the blood evidence, he awoke and tried to turn the light on before attempting to escape while night chased him through the house. He managed to open the front door and get outside, but he either stumbled back inside or was dragged back by night into the hallway, where he finally died after bleeding out. She had stabbed him 37 times in both the front and back of his body. Price's autopsy revealed that many of the wounds extended into vital organs. But if you think it ends there, then you are mistaken. Because here is the truly horrific part of all of this. We know by now that Catherine Knight was willing and more than capable of stabbing someone to death. And it was, in my opinion, inevitable. No surprise there. But what she does next is off the fucking charts. Once John was dead, Knight then methodically proceeded to skin the corpse, taking off the entire skin, including the face, ears, scalp, genitals, and neck like a macabre skin suit. She only left a small inch square of skin on the body. The square had the scar from where she had stabbed him previously. Knight peeled Price's body with such expertise and precision that she was able to leave the entire skin intact including his nose, ears, genitals, mouth, and hair. Medical officials reported that Knight had removed his skin in an experienced manner, allowing them to later reattach it to his body prior to the funeral service. They also estimated the time needed to do this would have been around 40 minutes. The skin suit, something harking back to the thriller Silence of the Lambs, was then hung up via a meat hook on the architrave of a door to the lounge room. Was this meat hook already screwed into the frame? Did Knight put this in after she killed Price or before? If it was after, where did she get it from? The amount of thought that goes into doing something like that is somewhat surprising. So once the skin had been removed, Knight then continued to defile the body of her lover by chopping off the skinned head and cooking it in a big pot on the stove. Knight then peeled and chopped up various vegetables potato, pumpkin, beets, zucchini, cabbage, squash, as well as gravy, and along with slices of his buttocks, which she baked in the oven, served them up as steak and vegetables for his two children, Jonathan and Beck. 
along with nameplates and spiteful notes placed next to each serving. Knight took her time painstakingly defiling his body. Her seemingly enjoyment of killing and torturing the dead body put her down as one of the cruelest in the annals of Australia's criminal history. Half-discarded pieces of meat were later found in the backyard, leading the police to speculate as to whether she had tried to eat the flesh and couldn't. Sometime later, Knight arranged the skinned body of Price with the left arm draped over an empty soft drink bottle with his legs crossed. This was claimed in court to be an act of defilement demonstrating Knight's contempt for Price. At around two to three in the morning, Knight then drove into Aberdeen and withdrew a thousand dollars from Price's bank account at an ATM. In her final act of woe is me, she lay down on the bed, swallowed a bunch of pills, later claiming she had attempted suicide and passed out. This is how the police found her the next day. At 6 a.m. the next day, a neighbor became concerned that Price's car was still in the driveway. And when he didn't arrive at work, his employer sent a worker to see what was wrong. Both the neighbor and the worker tried knocking on Price's bedroom window to wake him, but they alerted police after noticing blood on the front door. Breaking down the back door, police found Price's body, with night comatose from taking the pills. The pot on the stove with John Price's head in it was still warm when the police discovered it, estimated to be at between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius, indicating that the cooking had taken place in the early morning. When the police broke into the house and walked into the hallway, they initially thought that someone had hung a curtain in the doorway. It wasn't until they got closer that they realized it was John's skin. It was then that they also saw his skinless, headless torso on the floor of the living room. There was blood and bits of flesh everywhere. They then heard snoring from the bedroom and realized there was somebody alive in the house. Catherine was unresponsive on the bed surrounded by pill bottles. Police officers made the following report after arriving at the house the next day. About 6 a.m. on Wednesday, March the 1st, a neighbor noticed that the victim's, John Price, work utility truck was still at his home. This appeared unusual as the victim normally had left for work each day prior to this time. This neighbor became concerned, as did the employer of the victim, who was by this time making inquiries as to why the victim had not attended work. Attempts were made by the neighbor and another friend to wake the victim by knocking on his bedroom window. The neighbor and friend then went to the front door where they saw a small amount of blood on the wooden exterior. Police were contacted and attended about 8 a.m. The police at the scene forced entry to the house through the rear door. Upon entry, the police located the victim's exterior layers of skin hanging from a hook in a doorway arch into the lounge room. They then located the victim's decapitated remains on the lounge room floor near a small foyer 
leading to the front door. A further search of the house by police resulted in them locating Catherine Knight, who was snoring loudly in a comatose condition on a double bed at the end of the house. She was removed from the house immediately by police and later conveyed to hospital by ambulance. Went round the back, broke in through the back door. As we went in, I saw straight ahead of me the, um, what I thought was a curtain. There was something hanging, uh, blocking my entry into the hallway of the house. I, I thought it, it looked like a, some type of blanket or uh, some sort of covering that had been placed up on the, uh, on the archway. So I, I, I remember I used my left hand to push it aside and immediately I could feel coldness coming on my left arm. So I, I looked down and my left arm was just covered in blood. I realised then it was a, a human pelt, it was the skin minus the head. A full skin just hanging from the, from the top of the door frame. Looked past it and uh, saw a torso on the ground without a head and without any genitalia. So keep bracing yourselves. The worst is still yet to come. I am an all or nothing kind of girl. When I do these videos, I include everything. The following account is the complete report by crime scene investigator, Detective Senior Constable Peter Anthony Muschio, who was the first officer on the premises after the initial discovery of John Price's body. In cases such as this, it is the detective's job to piece together the facts firsthand from the evidence at the murder scene before anyone else touches anything. And believe me, what he saw that day with his own eyes is something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. About 10 a.m. Wednesday the 1st of March 2000, in company with Detective Sergeant Neil Raymond, I attended the premises at 84 St. Andrew Street, Aberdeen, in relation to an alleged homicide. The premises was built towards the eastern side of the block, leaving a grassed area on the western side where three vehicles were parked. My attention was drawn to a piece of cooked meat on the rear lawn in front of the white Ford sedan. I made an examination of this piece of meat and collected it for further testing. During my examination, I took a series of photographs of the premises and the piece of cooked meat on the lawn. I entered the premises to conduct a cursory examination with Detective Sergeant Raymond. I walked in through the rear door and into the kitchen. Once inside the kitchen, I saw a large section of what appeared to be human skin hanging from the top architrave of the doorway leading into the lounge room. This piece of skin extended from the top of the doorway right to the floor and appeared to be an entire human skin. Looking through this doorway into the lounge room, I could see a headless and skinless human body. I walked east along the hallway and looked into the entry foyer and saw an extreme amount of blood pooled on the floor. There was also a large amount of blood smearing over the eastern wall of the entry. I walked further east along the hallway and noticed some blood staining leading from the main bedroom. In this bedroom, I noticed more blood staining, however, only moderate amounts. There were items of clothing draped over the backs of each of the three chairs. On the dining room table was a tool bag, some clothing, a small blue folder, an electronic toy gorilla and some prescription medicine boxes. 
I noticed blood staining to the shoulder area of a blue shirt which was draped over the chair on the western side of the table. The medication on the table consisted of three boxes of Felador ER 5mg, of which two were empty. As mentioned earlier, I saw what appeared to be a complete human skin or pelt hanging from the top architrave of the door, separating the dining room and the lounge room. On closer examination, I could distinguish black curly hair at the top, a nose and part of the mouth and ear. About halfway down the pelt, I could see a clump of short black curly hair consistent with pubic hair. I could not recognize any other particular features as it continued to the floor. The edges of the pelt were incised, indicating to me that it had been removed with a sharp instrument. There were also a number of distinct stab wounds to the pelt, about a meter down from the top. The pelt was attached to the architrave by a stainless steel meat hook. The hook was pierced through the top of the head area of the pelt and then hooked over the architrave on the lounge room side of the door. The skin appeared to vary in thickness from approximately one to four centimeters. I noticed a blood trail leading from the lounge room into the kitchen towards the kitchen cooktop in the vicinity of the aluminium boiler. The boiler was on the right side rear element, which was at the time turned off. When I lifted the lid to the boiler, I noticed it was warm to the touch. The pot was full of liquid and on the surface, I could identify a skinned human head and a number of cooked vegetables. On the northern side of the aluminium boiler, I saw a baking dish which was sitting across the right front side element. Inside the baking dish, I saw an amount of liquid and the remains of baked vegetables. Just to the right or northern side of the cooktop, I saw two prepared meals. Each of the meals consisted of two pieces of cooked meat, baked potato, baked pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. Underneath each of the meals was a torn section of kitchen paper with a name written on it. The word Beaky was written in blue ink pen on one of the pieces while the word Jonathan was on the other. The pieces of meat appeared on the plates were similar to the piece I collected from the rear lawn. On the section of the kitchen bench across the northern wall were a number of items of interest. On the western end of the bench, I saw a green electric jug with blood staining about the handle. In the sink, I saw an orange colored vegetable peeler and the vegetable peelings from potato, pumpkins, zucchini and onion. On the eastern side of the sink, I saw a cream-colored microwave dish containing cooked cabbage leaves and a clearish liquid. In front of the microwave dish, I saw a brown-colored coffee cup that was sitting on a wooden cutting-up board. Inside the coffee cup was a teaspoon and a small quantity of thick brown liquid similar to gravy. There was also the residue of the gravy type substance on the cutting up board. Just to the right of the cutting up board was a yellow handled Swibo knife and two forks. The handle of the knife was bloodstained. I saw a bloodstained gray coffee cup 
which contained a white fatty substance. On the western side of the breakfast bar, I saw a Norton brand bench stone sharpening stone. On the cork tiled floor of the kitchen, at the southwest corner of the kitchen bench, I saw a blood-stained bare footprint. This footprint was from a right foot of a person and at the time the person was standing adjacent to the kitchen bench with the right foot facing north. I noticed blood staining to the fridge on both the handle of the door to the fridge section and the eastern side of the unit. The staining to the door handle contained some ridge structure and was in a position consistent with opening the door with bloodied hands. There were also smears on the eastern face of the fridge and lower down, staining from droplets of blood that had come into contact with this surface. The skinless and headless body of a person now known to me as John Charles Price was in a supine position, with his legs protruding into the entry foyer from knees down. There was a substantial amount of blood smeared over the carpet around the body. As mentioned earlier, there was also an extreme amount of blood pooling on the floor of the entry foyer. In this blood pool and staining were marks where the body of the deceased had been dragged about one meter from about the middle of the entry foyer onto the carpet in the lounge room. The deceased was laying on his back with his legs crossed at the feet. The left ankle was on top of the right. His left arm was extended and out from the body at an angle of about 45 degrees. Under the left wrist of his arm was an empty plastic 1.25 liter Shelley's Club lemon squash bottle. The right arm was also extended and lying alongside the body. On the floor, adjacent to the right arm of the deceased was a blood-stained 31 centimeter yellow plastic handled knife. The blade of this knife was 17.5 centimeters long. The body was virtually devoid of skin and flesh, exposing the muscles and some organs. There were a number of wounds present on the body, one of the most obvious being a stab wound to the left side of the chest, which extended into the chest cavity. As stated, the body had been skinned in a manner that leads me to believe that the person responsible would have had skill in this area. From the blood staining on the carpet, I was able to determine that the deceased had been skinned prior to being decapitated. There was a definite outline of the head in the blood staining on the carpet. Examination of the neck region of the deceased indicated that the head had been removed very carefully and cleanly with a sharp instrument. On the seat of the single lounge chair in the northeast corner of the room, adjacent to the shoulders of the deceased, was a black handled honing steel sharpening stone and an opened packet of Winfield blue cigarettes. I also noticed bloodied handprints on the back and arms of this chair. On the northern wall of the western side of the door to the kitchen was a small display cabinet. Lying on this cabinet was a broken picture frame containing a picture of the deceased. Lying on top of the picture frame was a blood-stained watch. To the west of the photograph, still on top of the cabinet, was a blood-stained handwritten note together with another broken picture on top of it. 
Apart from being blood-stained, it had small pieces of flesh on it. The note was poorly written and contained very basic spelling mistakes. It read, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You to Beck for Ross for Little John. Now play with Little John's dick, John Price. Staying true to my all or nothing pledge, here is what the autopsy revealed. The victim was dead when he was skinned. A razor sharp knife had been inserted just under his collarbone, sliced horizontally across the top of the body, from shoulder to shoulder, right under the clavicles. It was a straight, clean cut, anatomically precise. Then the knife was turned and cut down the chest and over the stomach to the pubic hairline and made into a T with another straight line. Tracing the knife tip around his pubic area and careful not to cut his penis or genitals, the killer cut down the front of John Price's thighs over the knees and to his feet. The killer then peeled the victim's skin off, including his head, his hair, his face, and all the way down the length of the body to the feet, exposing the victim's intestines. The entire skin was in one piece, including hair, face, ears, nose, mouth, genitals, and complete stab holes and dripping in blood. Hanging from the S-hook in the doorway, the feet were dragging on the ground. The killer then removed the victim's head clean at the C3-C4 junction, right at the top of the shoulders, using a very sharp knife. The cut was precise and clean. The killer would have been covered in warm, sticky blood. According to forensic pathologist Dr. Timothy Lyons, who performed the autopsy, the whole procedure would have taken about 40 minutes. Once Knight woke up in hospital, she claimed to have no memory of the night before. Catherine Knight was quickly charged with his murder. Despite intensive questioning, Catherine Knight denied having any recollection of what happened that night after she arrived at the house and had sex with her lover. Having recovered from her alleged suicide attempt, a week later on March the 6th, 2000, Catherine Knight was charged with John Price's murder at a special bedside sitting in the Maitland District Hospital's psychiatric wing. Although she feigned loss of memory, her downfall was evident showing that she had withdrawn money from his account the night she killed him. She had also told her brother three weeks prior to the killing that she was going to kill Price and plead insanity. Knight's initial offer to plead guilty to manslaughter was rejected. She was arraigned on February the 2nd, 2001 on the charge of murdering Price, to which she entered a plea of not guilty. Her trial was initially fixed for July the 23rd, 2001, but adjourned on account of her counsel's illness. It was refixed for October the 15th, 2001. When the trial commenced, Justice Barry O'Keefe offered the 60 jury prospects the option of being excused due to the nature of the photographic evidence, which five accepted. When the witness list was read aloud to the prospects, several more dropped out, after which the jury was impaneled. 
Knight's attorneys spoke to the judge and then he adjourned for the following day. The next morning, Knight changed her plea to guilty and the jury was dismissed. It was then made public that Justice O'Keefe had been advised of the plea change the day before. He had adjourned the trial and then ordered a psychiatric assessment overnight to determine if Knight understood the consequences of a guilty plea and was fit to make such a plea. Knight's legal team had planned to defend Knight by claiming amnesia and dissociation, a claim supported by most psychiatrists, although they did consider her sane. Two psychiatrists concluded that Knight suffered from borderline personality disorder. No reason has ever been given for the guilty plea, and despite giving it, Knight still refused to accept responsibility for her actions. Oddly, at the sentencing hearing, Knight's lawyers requested that she be excused from hearing some of the facts, but the application was refused. When Timothy Lyons took the stand and described the horrific things she did to Price, Knight became hysterical and was sedated. During the trial, one of Australia's foremost criminal psychologists, Dr. Milton, was asked to discuss his findings after interviewing Knight. Dr. Milton said that Knight suffered from borderline personality disorder, but knew exactly what she was doing on the evening of February 2000. On November the 8th, the judge pointed out Knight's lack of remorse, as well as the nature of the crime, required a severe penalty. Concluding, he stated, Catherine Mary Knight, you have pleaded guilty and have been convicted of the murder of John Charles Price at Aberdeen on or about February the 29th, 2000. In respect of your crime, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. The judge refused to fix a non-parole period and ordered that her papers were marked never to be released. This was the first time this verdict had ever been imposed on a woman in Australian history. Today, she is one of four women in Australia who have notes in their files saying never to be released. Knight, who was one of eight children, said her brothers had sexually assaulted her. She also alleged her parents routinely beat her and her siblings with a dog leash and an electrical cord. According to Knight, her father, who worked at a slaughterhouse, frequently hit her mother, leaving her with black eyes. The forensic psychologists who evaluated Knight remained skeptical of her accounts. Although multiple psychiatrists diagnosed Knight with both PTSD and borderline personality disorder, mental health professionals deemed her sane and fit to stand trial. While the judge who sentenced Knight accepted that she had BPD, he said that the diagnosis did not explain the time and the full circumstances of the killing, which come from factors not associated with the borderline personality. While she reportedly became upset when the prosecution read the details about the dismemberment of Price in court, Knight has never repented. The judge who imposed the life sentence maintained that Knight has not expressed any contrition or remorse, and if released, she poses a serious threat to the security of society. Knight is currently incarcerated at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, 
a maximum security facility in New South Wales that is home to some of Australia's most dangerous female offenders. In June 2006, Knight appealed the life sentence, claiming that a penalty of life in prison without the possibility of parole was too severe for the killing. Justices Peter McClellan, Michael Adams, and Megan Latham dismissed the appeal in the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal in September, with Justice McClellan writing in his judgment, this was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilized society. To this day, she maintains that all she recalls of that night is that they had good sex and both climaxed. Then she remembers that Pricey got out of bed to go for a pee and she watched him come back into the bedroom. After that, she presumes that she fell asleep and that was that. The general consensus of opinion is that she ate part of John Price and found what she did so abhorrent that she chooses to block it out of her mind. In prison, Knight works as a cleaner in the governor's office. Although she's a good cook, it is highly unlikely she will ever get a job in the kitchen. She's still serving her life sentence at Silverwater Women's Correctional Center in Western Sydney. She may be known as Cannibal Cathy and Australia's Hannibal Lecter, but Knight has a good reputation at Silverwater. She's referred to as Nana and has been described by fellow inmates as caring and maternal. According to Sydney author James Phelps, who wrote a book about Knight titled Green is the New Black, she is known as the Queen Bee, who sorts out disputes, loves to knit, and has also become religious. Despite this, Knight is not allowed to share a cell. She's a model prisoner, rarely causing problems with the guards. She does, on occasion, try to intimidate other prisoners by describing what she did. She does get visitors her daughter has visited. One time she told her daughter that she could get her killed from inside the prison. Her twin sister has also visited her a few times. Catherine has been reported to have said that she doesn't want visitors, that she's happy where she is, and that she feels safe now. I know this doesn't excuse her violent behavior at all, but I also wonder if this was all her sick way of dealing with the abuse she got when she was younger, if she did get it. After all, nobody could bully her. She made sure of that. She would lash out first. She was always the perpetrator in domestic violence, never the victim. So before I conclude this video, I just want to run through a timeline of Knight's violent behavior because it just astounds me that A, someone can get away with so much without being charged, and B, that she never killed anybody before John Price. In the following timeline, I've also included some non-violent actions, but they nonetheless demonstrate her vindictiveness. 1968, she was 13 years old when she appeared before the children's court on a minor charge and received a good behavior bond. 1968 to 1971, Catherine was by all accounts a pleasant girl who experienced uncontrollably murderous rages in response to minor upsets. At school, she was known for her violent temper. 
1968 to 1971, she assaulted at least one boy at school with a weapon. 1968 to 1971, she was once injured by a teacher who was subsequently found to have acted in self-defense. 1971, Catherine took great interest in her job and would often wander over to the start of the production line and watch the pigs actually having their throats cut. Others noted that Knight had an unusual approach to her job, reveling in certain aspects of it. She would nick the arteries of the animals just to watch the blood come out. 1974, she tries to strangle Kellett on their wedding night. 1976, Knight tried to stab Kellett with a broken beer bottle. 1976, first admitted to psychiatric hospital after violently pushing her new baby's pram down the street and almost onto oncoming traffic. 1976, Knight leaves her baby daughter, Melissa, on the railway tracks and walks away with the next train due any minute. 1976, Knight is admitted for a second time to St. Elmo's Psychiatric Hospital after threatening to kill people with an axe. 1976, Knight kidnaps a neighbor to get her to drive to Kellett's mother's house. She planned to kill her. She slashed her neighbor's daughter in the face. 1976, Knight is admitted for a third time into Morissette Psychiatric Hospital after holding a boy whilst waving a knife in the air. She had also intended to kill the mechanic because he had repaired Kellett's car, allowing him to leave her. 1976 to 1980, Knight is seen by her sister-in-law forcing her daughter's hand under a scalding hot tap. 1976 to 1980, Knight fractures Kellett's skull with a skillet. 1980 to 1984, fresh out of hospital, Knight stabs a police officer but was not charged. 1980 to 1984, David wakes up with Knight sitting on his chest with a knife at his throat. 1980 to 1984, Knight cuts a 16 year old severely across her face and is sent to the hospital for the fourth time. 1987, Knight cuts the throat of Saunders puppy 1987 to 1990, Knight hits Saunders in the face with a hot iron. 1987 to 1990, she stabs Saunders in the stomach with a pair of scissors. 1987 to 1990, she arrives at her sister's house with a shotgun saying that she had killed Saunders. 1987 to 1990, Knight vandalized David's car. 1987 to 1990, Knight is admitted to a psychiatric hospital for the fifth time. 1989 to 1990, Knight tells Saunders' daughter that he is dead. 1990, Knight takes out a restraining order against Saunders so that he couldn't visit his own daughter. 1990, there is only one violent event documented with Chillingworth where Knight smacks his glasses off his face and breaks his teeth. 1995 to 2000, because Price refused to marry Knight, she sends a tape to his boss showing medical kits that he had taken from the company rubbish tip, getting him fired after 17 years. 1995 to 2000, Knight tells friends on various occasions 
that she wanted to kill Price. 1995 to 2000, Knight stabs John on a few occasions. We don't have details of the different accounts, but we do know that John showed friends several stab wounds. 1995 to 2000, Knight tells one of Price's daughters that he was not her real father. 1995 to 2000, Price's children remember times when Knight would drive into a dog running across the road instead of swerving to avoid it. 1995 to 2000, she once asked her nephew to steal John's car, burn it, and then throw battery acid at John's face. 2000, Knight kills John Price. Most articles and videos refer to Knight as a cannibal. I would have to disagree, but at the same time, liken her more to Ed Gain, the butcher of Plainfield. Some of you might now be thinking, hang on, he was a cannibal. Well, that fact has actually not been confirmed. Many people assumed he was a cannibal, but he categorically denied ever eating human flesh. His thing was the skin of his victims. He liked to wear the skin, and Knight did something similar. I mean, she didn't prance about the house wearing his skin, but she certainly put it up on display, so there was a focus on his skin. However, there is also a Dharma-esque quality about her. The way she decorated her living room with dead animals and any object associated with death Dharma also had a thing about death. She certainly had a fascination with death and she was most probably desensitized through the years working at abattoirs, I can only imagine. Yeah, she cooked him, but did she eat him? Maybe she never got the chance to, I don't know. Would she have sat down with Price's kids and ate what she'd prepared? She was the one to send the children on a sleepover so she knew they wouldn't be returning anytime soon. And this fact alone tells me that it was all for effect. She had no intention of feeding them his flesh. I feel this was more of an act of spite and vengeance with a bit of insanity plea preparation thrown in. She couldn't do any more to Price. She'd already done the ultimate. So the next best thing was his kids. Catherine Knight was consumed with resentment. My first impression was that she hated Price so much at this point that the ultimate punishment would be for his children to eat his flesh. But I don't think it was directly to punish the children, but maybe the only thing left to punish him. I think this was all part of her revenge and part of her insanity plea. It wouldn't surprise me if the meat that was thrown in the garden was also for effect, just a little addition to her made up insanity. Throughout my research on Knight, I have also learned from several sources that she disassociated herself from all the childhood trauma. And I wonder if that is how she dismembered Price. Did she dissociate or did she treat it as one of her jobs at the abattoir? Or was this purely to set groundwork for her insanity plea? She'd already confessed to her brother weeks before that she was planning to kill John and knew how to get away with it. To kill him in such a way that no way will people think she is sane. So thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative and want to watch more from this channel, then hit that like button. It really helps to get this video out there to more people. It also tells YouTube to show you my next video. 
And if you don't want to miss that, then subscribe so that you will be notified for sure. Also consider supporting me by subscribing to my Patreon. Every little bit helps me to continue doing these videos. In the meantime, thank you, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you on my next video. Uh, I've uh, suffered a nervous breakdown in relation to um, um, my involvement in this matter. I know that it had a huge impact on the officers that day. She was trying to plead insanity and she told her brother that she's going to kill Pricey. She said, I'm going to kill him and she said, I'm going to get away with it. She said, I'm going to do it in the way to make him think that I'm crazy. I've spent most of my time uh, through treatment trying to um, forget about the actions of Catherine Knight, basically.